So our next speaker is Dr. John Hendrickson. I read his bio yesterday. I'm not going to read it today. You should all have heard it yesterday. It's a great bio, though. Um, but John, today is going to talk about using auxiliary buds to assess the impacts of management strategies on the abundance of invasive cool season grasses. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging my co-authors, uh, Andrew Carlson, David Toledo, and Chantel Kobolanski from the Northern Great Plains Research Lab. And also, and I forgot to add these co-authors on there, but I should also add on Sean D. Kaiser, Brianna Kabila, and Levi Benstock from NDSU, who had a portion of another project on here. So I apologize for that oversight, but um, I'm going to start off this talk by talking a little bit about population ecology. And I kind of hesitated on whether I should do this or not, but then I talked to uh, Holly Johnson and Andrew Carlson, who do all the heavy lifting in my research program. And they said, John, you made us miserable with this multiple times. Why not spread it around? And so I said, okay. <laughs> so, and this was kind of mentioned yesterday, but if you look at our grasslands in the Northern Plains, they're very much developed under disturbance. You know, if you look at our native grasses, they've had to do fire, grazing, drought, and even our introduced grasses have had to undergo, you know, grazing and understand how they respond to defoliation. And so when they do this, grasses have a tendency to develop coping mechanisms. And one of these coping mechanisms or persistence mechanisms is axillary buds. Now to put these in context a little bit, and this is where we talk a little bit about population ecology, is if you think, if you think about our communities out there, you know, when you look and you measure grassland community, you see, oh, we have all these different species, you know, but really what those, what that community is, is a collection of populations of different species, okay? And the idea with population ecology is we can understand something that's happening here at the population. We can maybe get an idea on why our communities are changing. And further there, populations are made up of individuals, and these usually when we talk about this with uh, our rhizominous plants, usually these are stems. If it's more of a cespitose where we know exactly what the plant is, we can kind of lump it into say a, a plant. But at the base of those individuals are uh, axillary buds. And axillary buds are very important in our grasslands. If you look at our native grasses, for example, and you look across there, about 99% of the grass shoots you see are going to be originally arise from axillary buds. So they make a big contribution to the persistence of these grasslands over time. They're kind of part of a modular growth form. And if you look here, you see, typically we call this a phytomer. It's where the node is. And then there's a leaf. There's an axillary bud right at the uh, axis of that leaf. And then there's an inner node. And if we go over here and look at this, and this is shrunk down so it's the crown but you kind of see the same thing. There's a, there's a node there and there's an inner node and there's, a, there's an axillary bud and this will kind of turn out to be a leaf. And the other thing, and I'm gonna to talk to about this later in the talk is that there's not just one of these on a crown, there's multiple ones. So we actually have multiple positions that can develop on that crown. And that's important when I'm gonna talk about what those different positions can turn out to be. Um, just a Kind of a side note there, when you look at most of our tillers, they actually come from the upper portion of this crown. Usually the ones down here that the older tillers that are developed down below usually don't grow out to be tillers. They're the, these, uh, I'm sorry, these axillary, these crown positions lower don't turn out to be tillers. So this just kind of shows, you know, a little bit about what these are. And I'm going to give a little bit better explanation of this later, but an important thing to remember about these axillary buds is that they can be a really big part of the meristematic potential we have out there. They can be larger than seed banks. And I was, I was trying to do some numbers on this and the numbers got really big, so I gave up on it. But basically, Kentucky bluegrass, you know, we ran some rough stuff and we had about 9,000 of these axillary buds per meter squared. And then if you wanted to get that up to a hectare, you take that times 10,000 and the numbers become really big and I'm just left it at that. But they can be really, you know, there's a lot of these out there. Therefore, we need to understand how our management impacts these because then it can help us understand how effective our treatments may be. 
The one thing to say is that I think they're really a, a good way to evaluate treatments. We do have to be careful when we say we can use these to predict the future. And there's a lot of slippage that can occur there. And so it's just, uh, just one thing that you need to think about. One other thing I wanna bring up before I start talking about this is a little bit about phenology. And uh, Sean had talked about this yesterday about how we're, you know, there are different phenological aspects to, to smooth brome, for example, and both smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass have our C3 grasses. Most of our C3 grasses have a tendency to produce two cohorts and new tillers every year, one in the spring, one in the fall. But to C4 grass, just the tendency is to have a more uh, consistent tillering pattern across the season. These two final points here, this one about Kentucky bluegrass axillary buds forming in the fall and uh, the smooth brome grass uh, axillary buds becoming more active after the reproductive phase. I want you to remember that because it kind of helps explain some of the things that we're talking about later in the, in the talk. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna talk about two projects we have. One looks at different uh, defoliation at different phenological stages in smooth brome. This kind of came up because I was looking at some, ex we had some long-term exposures at our location. I was looking at the amount of Kentucky or uh, smooth brome in those exposures compared to outside. There's a lot less outside where that was being grazed outside the exposure. So it suggested maybe there's something that's occurring there. The other is with drought and fire impact on axillary buds in Kentucky bluegrass. So these are kind of two distinct projects, but they both uh, revolve around axillary buds. So the first one is with the defoliation effects on smooth brome. And um, we basically had four different defoliation treatments and a control on this. The defoliation treatments revolved around the phenological stage. So they could be defoliated once when it was vegetative or twice in the vegetative stage. Uh, this elongation stage, that's when um, the, the grass plant starts to elongate. And you can tell that Sean mentioned this yesterday. You can kind of feel a little node there. When you run your hand up and down the, the stem, you can feel a little bit of a node there. And then also in the reproductive stage, which was, we call that roughly around the boot stage with that. And then we left an undefoliated control. We had 10 of these, each tillers in each block. And then there were three blocks and they were sort of placed in some pastures on loamy sites that we had at our location. These, these, uh, these were inside exposures on the pasture. So there was more of them and they're excluded, excluded from grazing, not only before we were tagging them, but also afterwards. You can see down here, when we mark these tillers, uh, we put a little, wire around the base of it. That's uh, We use telephone wire, but you can also use any type of wire there that's as long as it's bendable and colored and stays. But that helps us identify that for later on that we defoliated this specific tiller. So, you know, we, we did that at each stage and, and you can roughly think some of it was in May and, and maybe when it started elongating might have been June, you know, and, and reproductive too. But then in the fall, we came back and we collected these. And you can see when we collected them, oops. When we collected them, the other thing we did was we marked them with nail polish. And we mark them with nail polish there because that allows us to make sure that we're on the right tiller or shoot. Because when you start taking these up, sometimes they're fragile, they can break. Having that nail polish there lets us make sure that we're on the right you know, we're still getting what, the right one that we originally defoliated. Um, when we brought them back to the lab, we cleaned them up and then we did what we call a double staining technique on that. Basically we put them in tetrazoleum uh, for 24 hours. Tetrazoleum, basically the, if the cell is active, it takes up the tetrazoleum. We put them in Evans Blue. Evans Blue is, uh, is the type of stain that if the cell wall is compromised, it will go through the cell wall. And so we could tell if they were live or if they were, the axillary buds were live or dead based off of that. Remember I'd said that it was important to remember that they could have multiple 
you know, different positions on a stem. And we kind of can split these into categories. You know, we have our bud category here, which is active and dead, but also dormant, which are unstained. There is a little controversy about the dormancy using this technique to be fair, but uh, you know, this is a pretty rapid technique that, that, that we use. Um, we also looked at outgrowth. You can see here with tillers and rhizomes. And then this leaf scar here, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but sometimes you'd see these positions and there should have been something there, but you could not see anything. And so we would call that a leaf scar. And I'll give an example, I think on the next slide here. Yeah. So you can kind of see here, here's an axillary bud. That's what they look like. They're small, they're kind of conical. This is one that is active. You can see how that's stained red with the tetrazoleum there. Here's one over here, and this isn't showing up quite as good, unfortunately, but there's a, it, it's a very, very dark blue when it stains with the Evans blue in there. And up here is a dormant one, and, and those kind of have a tendency, there's like a blue tinge, but basically it's on the outside. It's not the deep blue stain that you see when it's, when it's truly dead. Leaf scars are like these areas here. You can see there's a discoloration there. So you kind of say, okay, there's something there that should have been attached there and we're not seeing it. So, um, so those are kind of the, the categories along with, you know, either a rhizome or, or tiller that grew out. So this is a, we call this, out, when we looked at outgrowth here, we said, okay, it could either be a rhizome or, or a tiller on here. And, uh, you know, there were differences between years, which is kind of what you would expect. But what I found kind of interesting between years also is there was differences in years between uh, between rhizomes and, and tillers. So certain years had a tendency to produce more rhizomes, certain years had a tendency to produce more tillers. But over here with the treatment, I really found this interesting. If you look at our total outgrowth here, if we clipped in the reproductive stage, we ended up getting more outgrowth than we did in any other stage with this. We got the least outgrowth when we defoliated twice in the vegetative stage. And if you remember, I said that axillary bud tillers could become more active after the reproductive stage. And this may be, a, this may be one sign of that. There's other things that, that could be active, you know, working on this, but this could be one of the things that increases the activity there. Uh, the other thing too, is that if you notice, over here that there were differences in the proportions of tillers and rhizomes contributing to that total outgrowth. Again, it was based off of the, the defoliation or the stage, the phenological stage that, that we defoliated in. This, and I, I hesitated a little bit to show this because <clears throat> there are, this is, I, I'm not using this information the way it truly should be used because I don't have the information for this, but it does give us a little bit of an example. And what that is, is basically, if you think of a tiller out there, what that needs to do is it needs to produce one live tiller or one live rhizome over its lifetime in order to maintain the population, okay? And so we could look at live tillers and rhizomes per crown when we got these. And the reason I say this wasn't total is, is that we don't know what happened to some of the dead ones. They may not have really totally, you know, uh, they may have emerged and died really quickly. We don't know if the, if the original tiller was dead here, but still this gives us a little bit of an idea on if that population is growing or not. So anything above one here is a population that's growing and you can see Regardless that every that our population was growing, but if we look here at defoliating it twice in the vegetative stage, we were reducing that population growth. And in fact, you look at the reproductive stage here and it was producing 62% more live outgrowth than when we defoliated it twice in, in the vegetative stage. And Looking at that here too, if you'll notice vegetative stage had the least outgrowth here, reproductive stage had the most. The other thing, and I just noticed this when I was going over my talk this morning is that I found kind of interesting is that probably what's, again, if you look at active buds and total live buds, which is you know the active buds plus the dormant buds because they have the potential to grow out also. We're seeing the most here in the reproductive stage, which you would expect, but there's also quite a few here in the, twice defoliated twice in the vegetative stage. And to me that says there is something happening 
between that bud being active and that rhizome growing out, there's something that's kind of short circuiting that ability to actually produce a new tiller in there. And I, I found that really kind of interesting with this and it needs to, we need to think about it more. Which brings us to the, some takeaways from this project, which is, you know, defoliation in, in the reproductive stage increases outgrowth. But what we really need here is we need to have a better understanding of the tiller demographics. And Zach Johnson, I know, has a poster on this that he's going to that he's actually looking at the tiller demographics in this. So it's uh, so I think that'll be kind of interesting in, to, to see what he's finding on that. The next project I want to talk about is uh, looking at axillary buds in Kentucky bluegrass. And when we looked at this, we were looking at two different treatments on here. One was burning. And the reason for that is, as you know, fire has the potential to reduce the abundance of Kentucky bluegrass, but socially there's been some constraints on us using fire across the landscape. The other thing too, is that if you look, and this is data from our location in Mandan there, if you look here between 1916 and 1990, we had about 15 inches of rainfall a year. In the 90s, that shot up to almost 20. So, and we're seeing that increase in precipitation, you know, throughout the decades after that, which says that not only did you know fire removal, but we also have this large increase in precipitation. And David Toledo and I, when we were talking about this project, you know, some people that we knew said, okay, you know, if we have a good drought, Kentucky bluegrass is going to go away. And so we said, okay, let's see if that's going to actually occur. So when we looked at this. <clears throat> We looked at this using kind of three different, or you know, three different uh, drought treatments. One was an ambient treatment. We used these rain intercept shelters, and you can see the more of these uh, uh, transparent plexiglass gutters we had on there, the more rainfall we intercepted. So we had a zero percent, which just got the ambient rainfall. We had a sixty percent, which got sixty percent of the rainfall that would fall on the plot, and a thirty percent. And we had those. Uh, oh, one other thing is then. Each plot, half of it was burned and half of it was left unburned. We used this firebox in order to do that. So each, each of these was replicated three times within these exclosures that we put up. And then each exclosure was replicated three times. We had three replicates within a block and then each block was replicated. Then we had three blocks of this. In addition, we had outside here, we had three additional plots where we wanted to look at grazing. We did not add the the rainfall uh, intercept on these plots because the livestock having access to them, but we did uh, burn and not burn them. So they could be grazed and burned, grazed and unburned. So we went out there and we sampled within these plots. We used a, a, a sampling probe. It was about five centimeters. We went down two or three centimeters. We brought the samples in. You can see how they were kind of, with Kentucky bluegrass, you see a lot of this, this root and uh, mat and thatch there. We cleaned them up, put them in tetrazoleum so we could just kind of see the activity on these. And um, then we analyzed this using a randomized complete block. So what did we find on this? And, and I found this kind of interesting. One is we had a time, sampling time by burning interaction. Burning had a tendency to reduce the number of axillary buds. You can see this across time, but there was a little bit delay. And I was thinking that we might see the maximum uh, impact here because these treatments have been in place since 2017. It would burned right the year before and we didn't. Instead, we saw the only significant time we, difference we saw between burning and unburning with number of axillary buds was here in November of 2020. And there's a couple reasons that that could be. One was uh, that September of 2019 was very wet. If you remember, I said that uh, Kentucky bluegrass has a tendency to form uh, its tillers in the fall. And if it had increased moisture during that time, or not tillers, but form its axillary buds in the fall, if it had increased moisture during that time, that could have uh, provided a larger pool of axillary buds. This here was, was burned in September and then we sampled in November. We do know that burning can sometimes reduce the amount of axillary buds on there, as you can see from all this other data. So, uh, you know, that could have been an impactor. The other thing, and I forgot to mention this, but it's important to know that 20 
uh, growing season in 2020 was like at the Bismarck weather airport weather station was the third driest year since they started keeping records. And 2021 was also really dry. And in fact, it was probably even drier than 2020, just because we didn't really get any moisture till later in the year. And so what I think you're seeing here with a reduction in the number of the, oops, reduction in the number of axillary buds there is that that's an impact of drought. That that dryness was there and, you know, it was continued dry. And so we're, we're seeing some of that impact of drought there. So what about drought? Well, when we look at this, we see again, that regardless of our drought level, burning had a tendency to reduce the number of axillary buds, but it was really only significant at that 30% drought level. And so I think this interaction here between a moderate drought and burning is going to be important to think about in the future. Again, one thing to remember here is these rain intercept shelters intercepted the amount of precipitation that was falling and it was dry anyway, you know, during the two years that we did this. And you just need to think about that a little bit when we're thinking about these interpretations uh, of what's going on here. But that again could say why well, my thought would be at the 60% that we're seeing a suppression in axillary bud numbers that we're just not seeing the big difference between the burning and the not burning that we did see at the 30%. Finally, at the grazing, and with the grazing, we did not see a big difference here. There was, uh, I looked at this several times. <clears throat> it looks to me like grazing adds variability to these axillary bud numbers, but there's not a clear trend with the impact of grazing on it. The only time I saw that there might be <clears throat> some impact of grazing or might have interacted with burning was clear down here in November of 2021, when we're seeing a little bit lower uh, numbers of Kentucky bluegrass axillary buds uh, with grazing compared to burning. So there might've been a little interaction there, but that did not show true through the rest of this, uh, the rest of the, the project. The other thing here to remember too, and, and I don't know if you've kept an eye on this axis here, which is the number of axillary buds per meter squared, but again, there's a ton of them. Like I said, there's about, you know, there's 10,000 here per meter squared. If you scale that up, you're seeing a lot of numbers there. And it just shows how resilient these are. You know, there's a lot of axillary meristematic potential out there that has the potential to turn into a tiller or something. So these are, are very resilient <clears throat> grasses and we can throw a lot at them and it's hard to, it's hard to really reduce them as much as we want to based off of this. So looking at what we found out with the, with the summary here that we had from the burning and, and drought on, on with Kentucky bluegrass, Burning is important. And I think, you know, even though it wasn't always significant, we did usually have a trend that there was less axillary buds when we burn than when there wasn't. So I think that says burning is kind of an important, is an important tool to think about using here. Um, one thing to keep in mind with the burning is that it may be linked as far as effectiveness with your weather patterns. And again, I'm thinking about that wet September we had in 2019, and we weren't seeing the impact of that burning out into the fall. So there may be something, I mean, into the spring, the following spring. Grazing, we really did not, grazing, we could not see a, a clear story with that. It could be one there if we tease it out more, but I, I really did not see a clear story with what, with what the data we had. I found this one interesting here where probably the maximum, our, our significant difference with between axillary bud numbers with burned and unburned came under moderate drought. To me, that's something as, as uh, land managers and others, I mean, that's kind of could be a hard sell to some people to say, okay, if you want to maximize the effect of your fire, you got to wait till you're going to burn up some of your forage when it's dry. And it's one of those things you just have to think about as you're, as you're talking about this. And the and an extreme drought can limit the effectiveness of burning, you know. And again, if you look at work, we're harvesting sixty percent of very limited rainfall there. Some of these plots were probably getting. I think we had eight inches for the whole year. You know, sixty percent of that is. I mean, you're down to maybe they're getting two or three inches of, of rain on some of these on some of those plots. 
So overall, I do think that we can evaluate, use these axillary buds as a way to kind of evaluate the effectiveness of strategies. I think we saw that with burning with the Kentucky bluegrass, and we also saw that with clipping at the different phenological stages with the smooth brome. We do need to think a little bit about the management by environment action. I would also say, thinking about adding on there the management by, by morphological stage or the phenology uh, with, with looking at how these grasses, and for example, on the smooth brome, when we defoliate with the Kentucky bluegrass, thinking about when we're going to apply the fire to maximize the effectiveness. And finally, like I said before, there's a lot of meristematic potential out there with these looking at these axillary buds, while that's, that can be overwhelming, it does show us that these grasses are really resilient and that we, as I said yesterday, it's not a one and done type of thing. These type of management uh, strategies have to be repeatedly placed on the landscape in order to maximize the effectiveness of them. So with that, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.